lovely, lovely imps. A few weeks ago, I saw the TV glow. That's right. I saw a movie called I Saw the TV Glow. It has a, uh, it has a really, really cool uh, movie poster that looks like this. It's a, people have been talking about it a whole lot. It was directed by Jane Schoenbrunn and starring Justice Smith and Bridget Lundy Payne. It was a, uh, a, a truly fantastic horror film. And I've waited a couple of weeks to talk about it because I wanted to give people time to go see it. It is now on streaming. You can see it on, uh, I think it's on Amazon. So you can see it for pretty cheap up on Amazon. I highly recommend you go see it. Uh, I'm going to do a little review and a discussion here. The second half of this is going to have uh, spoilers, but I'll let you know so you can tune out if you want to, if you don't want to have any spoilers. Um, but I highly recommend you go see this movie. Uh, it is a, a absolutely gorgeous film, um, and it is on a the topics and themes that it is built around are uh, incredibly important, especially right now. I Saw the TV Glow is a movie about, uh, on the surface, it's a movie about uh, two high schoolers who are both sort of obsessed with this, you know, uh, young adult uh, TV show uh, kind of in the vein of like a Buffy the Vampire Slayer type TV show. It's a it's a show where the characters of the show are, are fighting a monster of the week and there's a big bad character that they go after. And they these two characters who are both sort of socially alienated bond over this TV show. And from there, the whole story unfolds. Um, the soundtrack is absolutely incredible from beginning to end. It is a uh, breathtaking soundtrack. Uh, I absolutely adore it. The, the, the energy of the soundtrack is like, uh, it's like a soul trying to break free. And, and at times it does, and at other times it doesn't. But I, uh, I truly love it. And uh, it's, it's uh, the, the, the choice of styles throughout the movie creates a very dreamlike experience. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of this that I Saw the TV Glow is a horror movie. And when I when I went and looked at some of the like trailers for this movie and when I heard some people talking about it as a horror movie, I expected something very different. Um, it is not the type of horror movie where, you know, things scary things jump at you or there's a, you know, uh, you know, lots of gore or anything like that at all. It is a deeply psychological horror film and its most horrifying moments are emotional and psychological. Um, not like, you know, the, the sort of like get your heart beating going, ah, like, oh, what if there's a monster around the corner? Um, in fact, most of the monsters that you see in this movie are quite funny intentionally. Um, the special effects of the of the monsters and the the, the characters um, are sort of intentionally over the top and a little cheesy, uh, and I quite love it. They're fantastically made, um, but they have a very particular look that evokes, you know, low budget television monster effects. It's in really really well done. Um, as far as the cinematography goes. Uh, the entire time I was watching this movie, I couldn't stop thinking about David Lynch. Um, most of my viewers will know that I'm a huge, huge fan uh, of David Lynch. And this movie reminded me uh, in so many ways of, of David Lynch's films. The, the choice of shots, the way that the characters were directed, the, the characters have this um, incredibly strange energy to them. Uh, that is that is shared with a lot of David Lynch's films, which can be off-putting to people. Um, and I always want to tell people, you just got to look a little deeper and 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 try and overcome your your sort of preconceptions about how uh, 
you know, characters are supposed to act in a show. Uh, in this, in this, or in a movie, in this case. Um, in, in this movie, the characters have a tendency to sort of monologue at the screen in, in sometimes disorienting fashions. And it can be very off-putting. It's very intentional. It's designed to, uh, to, to feel uh, uncomfortable and, uh, and confrontational in a weird way and a little bit alien in some ways. Um, and there's a whole bunch of reasons for it that we're going to get into in a little bit. Um, but I wanted to talk about that in the review portion because it's something that I've noticed that some people have complained about. And they also complain about that in David Lynch's stuff as well, where in, in especially in like the later seasons of Twin Peaks, um, the characters behave kind of strange sometimes uh, in, and not in the ways that you would assume from other films. And some people can't handle that. I find it fascinating when a movie decides to go with very different directorial decisions where the actors are, uh, uh, you know, when the actors communicate their lines um, in, uh, in, in ways that don't necessarily feel like like uh, the, the sort of standard accepted practice for what an organic conversation is. In truth, though, sometimes conversations in the real world can be very uncomfortable, especially when all of the characters involved are under psychological duress and are perhaps disoriented about what's happening to them. Um, it's, uh, it's amazing. Uh, I cannot recommend I saw the TV glow enough. Uh, for me... It is like a 9 out of 10, maybe even a 10 out of 10 film. I, uh, I, I really, really like it a lot. Um, and uh, the performances are fantastic. Um, and, uh, you know, Justice Smith, uh, Bridget, Bridget, I don't know exactly if it's Bridget or Bridget. I don't know. Bridget, I don't know exactly how uh, her name is pronounced. Bridget Lundy Payne. Um, Brigitte, I don't know. People say different in different ways. I'm not 100 percent sure, but regardless, uh, both absolutely fantastic as the the leads of the film. It's pronounced baguette. I don't think it is, but maybe. Um, uh, oh, that's good to know. I didn't know that. That's fantastic to know. Uh, but but uh, absolutely uh, fantastic, uh, fantastic film and uh so now is the part where i i have given my little quick review and the quick rundown of the major features of the film uh the the aspects of it that i found compelling um and now i want to talk about the like the 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 meat of the film uh and why and i and, and why that really knocks me out of the park so this is the part where i'm i'm gonna say we're gonna get into spoilers I wanted to give a rundown to go, you know, sell the film for people who haven't seen it so that they'll go watch it because I do feel like you will you will enjoy this movie the most if you don't know exactly what you're getting into. I know this might sound crazy. I don't want to alarm you. It's going to get pretty heavy here and uh, you know, I don't know how else to avoid that. So, there you go. So, the the film I saw the TV glow uh, is in many many ways uh a movie about transgender repression and transgender regret uh and i don't mean regret uh in the way that you hear it used in the uh in the popular culture at the moment where you know it's used as a, almost a propagandistic term to to speak badly about trans people. Instead, I mean about uh, not, uh, in, this, in this case, it's about not making the decisions that you need to make, about um, allowing other people to make decisions in your life for you, uh, as opposed to uh, uh, setting out and, and making the choices that are right for you. Um, and it goes very, very hard on this front. Uh, it's one of the most uh, uh, painful films that I've seen in a very long time when it comes to just blatantly confronting and throwing it at the screen 
um, the fact that uh, you only get to live one time. And, and if you don't weigh that fact, that one life that you have, if you don't weigh that carefully, um, you can damn yourself to a horrible, painful, agonizing, and suffocating existence. Throughout the film, we, uh, we, it's, it's really incredible. One of the things I love most about this film is that it is completely non-linear as far as time goes. Um, it is a movie that is narrated by the character Owen, who is a sort of a uh, very awkward and lonely uh, kid at the beginning of the movie. Uh, but throughout the movie, we're flashing forward, we're flashing back. Time flows um, totally unnaturally in this film. We go to the future, we go to the past, we jump far into the future eventually. Uh, and we never really... We, you, you, it kind of pulls you all over the place in a very disorienting fashion for a lot of the film. And uh, it's, it's incredible because uh, that disorientation is later revealed to be the product of uh, the, the combined product of an unreliable narrator and a narrator who is uh, severely, severely repressing negative or, or certain memories. So we, 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 are, we are being told a story by our narrator, Owen, that is missing enormous sections. And we never fully know whether until the very tail end of the film, we never really know whether Owen has uh, is is even aware of these things fully, if we're being lied to, or if Owen just can't remember these types of things. It's an, it's an incredible touch, um, and there is one point in the movie where uh, uh, our our you know other character Tara uh, is basically the only character in the entire film, um, they go out of their way to basically sp speak to the audience in a, in, and, and, uh, uh, and, and acknowledge the audience's disorientation to basically be like, don't you feel how time is moving all wrong? Don't you feel all of this? Don't you feel like stuff is missing? And it's this incredible thing because it's a, co a confrontation towards the character Owen while also, at the same time, uh, validating a very real emotion that is going to be present in, in most of the audience. That the audience uh, is going to be feeling like there's stuff, something is missing here. I don't understand why we're, we're going forward and back in time, why we're jumping through years that just disappear. It's not strictly a fourth wall break, um, but it is, um, but it is, uh, it is, it, it, it pierces the fourth wall without like being what you normally think of a fourth wall break. Like there's no character that turns to the camera and goes, hey, you. It's instead a validation of, of what everyone else is experiencing as you ride along in the film. Um, so throughout this movie, uh, at the beginning of the movie, what we understand is... Uh, we basically only see one part of the story for the first, I'd say maybe the first half of the film, which is this character Owen uh, and his friend Tara. Um, uh, Tara at the time, at the beginning of the movie, goes by the name Maddie. And uh, they, they are both kind of, they're both kind of awkward losers at their school. They don't have a lot of friends, neither of them do. And they start to bond over um, this TV show, like I mentioned. They, they bond over a, over a TV show called The Pink Opaque. And uh, it's, it becomes a, it's a hyperfixation for Maddie, and it becomes a hyperfixation for Owen. And we see, as the movie goes on, that they are really attached to this TV show uh, to the point where uh, like Owen's family does not allow him to watch the TV show. Um, he, he's like... His dad, at one point, the, his dad literally says, isn't that a show for girls? And won't let him engage with it. So Owen actually has to kind of come up with a lie to his family so that he can go and hang out with his friend and watch this movie, or watch this TV show. And uh, his friend, who is at the time named Maddie, um, 
is is basically smuggling him recorded um, uh, VHSs. Uh, uh, no, I absolutely will, Lydia. In this case, uh, you will understand why I'm going to say that um, in a minute. Um, so uh, Maddie is smuggling VHSs to Owen, and uh, and that is an incredibly special uh, uh, thing for Owen. And now, as the movie goes on, uh, we get to a point where Maddie basically says, I'm going to run away. I can't do this. Like, I can't live my life anymore. I'm not happy. I need to run away. I need to go and live my own life. And Owen is terrified. Um, uh, uh, is, is terrified of this. And, uh... And Maddie invites Owen, says, Owen, we, we've always had a connection. Run away with me. We're both miserable here. This town is not going to do it. And when we reach this point as viewers in the movie, we're kind of confused because we don't fully understand why Maddie wants to run away so bad. It's just like, that kind of seems sudden. And Owen is like, I can't do that. I'm not going to do that. So uh, Owen sort of agrees at first and then backs out at the last minute, and Maddie disappears. This becomes an incredibly traumatic moment for Owen because Maddie was Owen's basically Owen's only friend, and also because uh, so Owen is left alone, fixating on this television show that represents something that they had together. Now time goes forward, and Owen continues to live his life, um, and. Uh, and one day, Maddie reappears and looks very different. And when Owen addresses Maddie as Maddie, Maddie says, that's not my name anymore. And uh, this is where the film kind of starts to twist your brain and, 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 and it starts to hurt a lot. So uh, Maddie uh, has become Tara. And from now on, I will refer to Tara as Tara. Owen, uh, and, and Tara invites Owen, hey, come to a spot. You know where it is. Here's where I want you to come meet me. Come meet me here and we'll talk more. I've been gone for 10 years or eight years. And I want to tell you what's been going on. And I see you're still living this way. And so Owen agrees and goes and meets up with Tara. And they go to this um, incredible bar that is just completely loaded to the top with queer people. It is, it is incredible. It is a gay bar of the highest order. And uh, the music is amazing. It really reminded me of, of, uh, of Twin Peaks The Return, where it's, uh, it is all, um, it is all, uh, uh, what's the term? Oh no, I'm messing, uh, diegetic music. It's all, all of the music in this part of the movie uh, is in the world. So they're sitting in a bar and there is a live music performance and that is the music for the movie at that part. And they're talking about things. Um, they're talking about all kinds of stuff. And Tara is, is saying, um, is basically like, what do you remember about our time together? And Owen is like, we used to watch TV. We used to watch The Pink Opaque. We used to enjoy this TV show. And Tara goes, okay, but what was it really? What was the show? Was it just about a TV show for you? Or was it something more? And Owen is like, it was a TV show. And then Tara is, is saying, Tara keeps saying, it was a real thing. There was something real. We bonded about the, the pink opaque. We bonded through a theme in this TV show. And Tara begins to speak almost um, exclusively in metaphor at this point. And as Tara continues to ask Owen more, we get flashbacks. And the flashbacks reveal that actually they didn't just watch a TV show. That during the time that they were spending together, they would talk about all kinds of things. And we finally slowly work out a memory from within Owen's mind of Owen dressing in a beautiful pink dress. 
And then it all kind of starts to click. We also start to see uh, as, as, uh, as Tara continues to, um, it, to like use this metaphor, uh, throughout the movie, there have been these moments where we go into their imagination and we see the characters that they, they're like, basically they're OCs. They make OCs that are, that are in the pink opaque universe. And we now realize that like their OCs are, are truly self inserts. One of them is named Tara and the other one is named Isabel. And we now see with this flashback that the pink dress is the same one or a very similar one to what Isabel is wearing in their little imaginary OC universe. And uh, this kind of causes Owen to have a, uh, a freak out. Uh, Owen starts to freak out and basically be like, I don't know what you're talking about. This is crazy. Um, and so Tara says, L meet me at our school tonight. I have something to show you. And, uh, and so Owen, feeling very scared, decides to go to the school and, and finds a, a tent has been set up. And inside the tent, Tara has set up a a projector and a and a turntable and has basically made a presentation and uh this presentation is a is tara talking about in terms of in the metaphor of 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 the show of the the of the pink opaque show talks about how they basically died. They buried themselves alive and went through the greatest agony imaginable, but that they came out the other side. And when they came out the other side, they had become, they had gotten the powers of the characters of their characters that they invented as children. Um, and this whole section is, uh, it's extremely dreamlike and, um, and it, it, it sort of fades between Im the imaginary and the real over and over again. But we obviously see that it is, uh, it is not literally referring to gaining the powers of the TV show, but rather uh, that Tara is, is talking about a, a, a sense of becoming, of becoming something real, something that was valuable to them. And they confront Owen gently, but also firmly, and basically go, I know that you know that this is real. I know that, uh, uh, that, that, that you know that this, that what I'm saying is real. And I, and, and Tara says, uh, there's this great line where Tara basically says, um, the cost of coming back to this town has been incredible and I can't do it again but I didn't want to leave you here suffering. So please consider coming with me this time. Um, and at first it doesn't hundred percent check, but if you think about it for a second, the cost is of course that Tara came back to a place where no one knows them as Tara, where, and, and it gets even worse because Owen uses Tara's old name again, despite Tara explicitly saying, I don't go by that name anymore. And, um, it's a really painful scene. Um, and basically, uh, Tara says, come with me. Like, there is, a, uh, there is a grave, just like the one that I had to go into, and I've made it for you. And if you want to, I will be with you as you go through this in a way that I didn't have. I, I went through this alone, but you don't have to be alone. And so they go out to this football field, um, where there's a grave, an open grave has been dug and that, that Tara like prepared basically for Owen uh, so that Owen could go through the transformation to become a member of the pink opaque like in their TV show. And when they get out there to the field, Owen um, freaks out and tackles Tara to the ground and then runs. And... Uh, and, and then he locks himself in his house 
and refuses to see Tara again until Tara's gone. And at this point in the film, we have basically one more scene before an absolutely enormous time skip. And the, the scene that we go through here is uh, Owen basically obsessively diving back into the TV show, the, 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 the pink opaque TV show. Um, he watches it obsessively. He watches it obs so obsessively that he starts to become uh, genuinely suicidal. And he actually, at one point, uh, yearns so strongly and so self-destructively to jump into the TV show that he puts his head through a TV. And he is rescued by his father, the father who has been basically uh, constantly uh, trying to get him to behave a certain way. He's saved by his father, who pulls his head out of the TV and puts him into the shower. And in this scene, uh, despite this scene apparently happening in like the, the real world, we see that the overlap between the, the, the imagined reality of the, of the pink opaque and reality and the reality that, that the characters live in every moment of their days start to meld. And it gets to the point where, um, Owen starts vomiting up like this blue substance, like he's just throwing it up all over the place, all over the, 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 um, all over the bathroom and all this stuff. And that tie into, in the TV show, the blue goo is a, uh, is like a substance that, that, uh, uh, tranquilizes and, uh, weakens the characters of the show so that they can have their hearts removed by the villain of the show, a character named Mr. Melancholy. And uh, we see Owen like throwing up all this blue juice. Uh, and then his, his dad is like there, like washing him and basically putting the blue juice right back into him again, right after he throws it up. Um, and yeah, that happens too. That's true. Um, but uh, uh, we, we start to put together that this blue goo is, uh, is sort of fed fed and brought in. It's something that is brought in from the outside that prepares someone to have their heart removed. Um, and that Owen is like throwing this up essentially in the, at all, you know, in great quantities that, that Owen has consumed an enormous amount of this blue goo. Um, and the implication of course being that, uh, you know, Owen's heart is gone. And of course that is something that Tara says. Tara, uh, states, I traveled to the lair of Mr. Melancholy, and my heart was there, and so was yours, but I can't get it. Only you can get it. Um, and then we get a time skip. The movie jumps forward 20 years, um, and we see Owen uh, in this part. No more is there the dream-like quality to anything. Owen is narrating directly at the screen, telling you what is. Uh, we, we no longer have the influence of Tara. We no longer have the influence of the, imagina the imaginary or the dreamlike world of the pink opaque. It is just from, the, from this point out, it is Owen speaking to you directly. And there's even a part where, uh, where Owen is like, I never saw Tara again says the wrong name a third time, but I never saw Tara again, but I'm fine. I'm happy. I have a whole family and I love them very much. And we don't ever actually see the family in the film. The, the movie, the family is never actually shown in the movie at all. Um, but nonetheless, Owen looks at the camera and tells you. And, uh, and then it proceeds to this, uh, this horrifying scene where where Owen is uh, basically gasping, increasingly every single day, gasping for breath, uh, uh, suffering painfully, um, and eventually completely snaps um, and has a public breakdown um, at his job, uh, which, of course, uh, which at that point, 
the seams on reality start to break. He has a breakdown and nobody sees it happen, implying that it's literally only in his mind, that he is screeching out loud, screaming for help in his mind, and no one else can actually perceive it. They don't see it. They don't hear it. They can't help him at all. It is, it is in his mind that he is screaming in agony, uh, nearly dying. Um, it's a horrifying scream. I, I mean, it, it, at one point, Justice Smith is like, is like, l like literally uh, screaming for his mother, like literally screaming, "Mommy, please save me!" As like a like a I don't know, like forty plus year old character screaming for for his mother, um, and and then he kind of uh, uh, oh yeah, we also see him at home was still watching the TV show from his childhood, The Pink Opaque. And when he watches it now, uh, it is like, he's like, it's cheesy. And when we see him watching it now, it's completely different than what it was before. When we saw them watching it before, it was like a Buffy the Vampire Slayer type show, like a little cheesy, but pretty exciting. Now when he goes and watches it, um, the show is like literally like a children's show, like, they're like, there's like no budget at all. The children are just like goofing around. It's like the, the characters look really dumb. It looks like a Barney type TV show. And um, he's like, he's just watching it over and over and over again out of a sense of like nostalgia for like the most raw, like comfort item has this show has become. And, um, and then the film ends with... Uh, with a really horrifying and violent scene of Owen harming himself. Uh, and uh, it's, it's wild. Um, it, it's wild how uh, intense, intense that final bit is. Now, uh, this is all the, the spoilers are now, like, you know, I've, I've laid out all the spoilers for the film. But uh, there's a couple of things that stood out as particularly masterful and shocking to me. One is uh, the level of basically audience gaslighting that goes on from the narrator. Like, Owen's character is the most unreliable narrator that you can imagine. Not only can we not trust his recollection of real-world events, but we can't even trust his recollection of the the cartoon or of the tv show not a cartoon the tv show that he watched we see it take various forms based on how he's feeling about it and at the end of the film the show has become like nothing it's not even like it's an almost unwatchable like show that's meant for children it's a children's plaything and we don't know what version of the show it really was because the show wasn't what it was about of course in reality what, what the pink opaque stood for, what it actually stood for, for both Owen and Tara, was them exploring gender together, was, was them both exploring their identities together and finding togetherness in a world that was very hostile to them and that didn't understand them and that constantly tried to repress them. And for Tara, Tara saw this for what it was and, and said, I have to do something about this. I can't just live in a fantasy built around a children's children's television show. And for Owen, Owen made the sort of the horrifying decision, the decision to say, it's just a TV show. What are you talking about? To the point that that li of literally suppressing actual memories that 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 he had that were that were Oh, by the way, I think the only time we see Owen's character smile in the entire movie, I forgot to mention this, it's kind of important, but I think the only time we see Owen's character actually smile in almost the entire movie is when he's wearing the dress, the pink dress. That's basically the only time. And he, does, and, and he refuses to acknowledge that memory. He represses that memory um, because to confront it, would mean to acknowledge that the pink opaque wasn't just a comfortable nostalgic television show. It wasn't just a comfort blanket, but rather it represented two people exp exploring and being honest with themselves in a way that they otherwise felt that they couldn't. And also, of course, it would mean confronting the missed opportunities. The, opp the missed opportunity to run away with Tara in the first case, and the missed opportunity to have Tara help in the second case. 
it's um, a painfully brutal movie in that regard. Um, it's a uh, it's a movie that is represents like and it's so the ending is so horrifying that's why i say it's not like your typical horror horror movie that it's so psychological because the horror sets in at the end of realizing our character isn't going to be okay our character is dying while being alive our character is a functional zombie and that he refused every opportunity that he had because of fear and instead lives a life of agony. And it is extremely sad. Prosy Rosie says, real question, does Tara even exist? Yes, in my opinion, my read of the film is that absolutely, Tara is absolutely real. Tara is a friend who chose to transition and went through a lot of hell for that. Uh, Tara chose to be who they are. Tara chose and, and to to bury themselves in a gra in a grave alive to bury themselves alive and go through the ultimate pain but that they came out the other side uh, as a different person they ran away from home and left everything in their life because they needed to be who they are Tara represents that and also that they came back they came back and and endured misgendering endured uh, a refusal of their identity even at the hands of their best friend. Note that Owen repeatedly um, dead names and disrespects Tara's wishes. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the, it's, it's so much, oh my God. Also, one thing, there's a, um, Yes, exactly. Uh, Gayfesh says, I also saw the scene at the end where Owen is screaming for his life to a room of people who ignore him, and then he goes and apologizes for the outburst, and they again ignore him, as kind of a, just a commentary on how society would be happy to just ignore all pleas of our community. I think that's an accurate read um, as well. I think that's just as, I mean, I think it's, the, the basic idea is that whether that outburst actually happens, like truly, um, as in like he actually screams into the room or whether it's just abundantly apparent that this person is suffering and nobody cares and aggressively ignores it. I think the, I think that conclusion is correct. The idea that this is a society that is more than happy to ignore and assist in the repression, that it, there is a societal level gaslighting, um, telling you at all times that the pink opaque does not exist, um, uh, that the that all of it is is just in your head um, and that everything that you're telling yourself is a lie a childish lie uh, made up it's so painful on that front um, it's it is uh, it is so incredibly painful and that's the crazy thing because on one hand um, Owen is validated constantly um, by, by refusing to acknowledge this past, by saying, oh, it's actually just a TV show. But Owen has to become basically, Owen has to become, um, like, uh, uh, what's the right word? Um, obstinately ignorant in order to not understand the, com the metaphors that Tara is using. Be but it's convenient, of course, and, and it's validated in that way. As the viewers... The only person who ever validates what we have seen and what we have experienced is Tara. And it's so interesting in that front that it makes the movie, like, so incredible on that front. Because the whether or not you're trans or queer or have ever experienced being in the closet or repression or anything like that, um, you are put into the foot, you're put, you're put into the shoes of, of someone who has by that experience, by the fact that um, that you have a character, the protagonist that you're supposed to be able to trust talking at you at all times, and you're clearly missing things. Something is wrong, and you can tell that it's wrong. And the only person who tells you this is the character who also experienced that and overcame it through incredible pain. It's a masterful, it's a, a masterful stroke. Um, and... Yeah. 
genuinely incredible um how how in how strongly this movie communicates its themes Denverton Denverton RD says the part when Tara calls Owen Isabel so tenderly as they tried to convince him to find his heart again yeah I know it's brutal it's a uh, it is an attempt at appealing to the true self through all of it and it doesn't work and it's so sad it's so unbelievably painful to witness and the crazy thing is of course we know through the rest of the film through all the 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 sections of 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 the imaginary ocs and all of the memories and all of this stuff we know that owen really does see himself aspirationally he wants to be the isabel so badly but he can't he won't he, he is too afraid to do it. And the film never judges the fear, ever. Not at all. Never once does the film like say that Owen is wrong for being scared. In fact, Tara goes out of their way to, um, goes out of their way to, to, to validate the fear. Um, and to, to, communicate that like yes it's terrifying but i promise you there is hope on the other side that you will suffocate and your heart will be gone forever if you can't overcome that fear um it's it's a uh it's a it's an incredibly painful movie and also an incredibly amazing and beautiful movie um i went and saw it with three other trans people and uh and we were all devastated. We talked about it for hours afterwards. It ended up prompting us. We went out to dinner afterwards and we were sitting in a you know private kind of booths area and we were all sitting there talking about our various experiences with transition. Did a trans person make this movie? Yes, yes. The director is trans and non-binary. I can't recommend it enough. There are, um, there's so much that I haven't even been able to talk about and I don't want to go too long because I did say that I wasn't going to do the longest review. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, there is another thing I should mention at the end of this movie, there is a part where Owen is walking down a road and, uh, while Owen is walking down the road, he crosses over um, a bunch of sidewalk chalk. And in the sidewalk chalk, is it's glowing brightly, and it says, there is still time. And uh, that is like, that is the biggest fourth wall break in the entire movie. It's the, the movie literally reaching out and kind of poking people. I, I, I tend to agree with uh, MKJ Moon. MKJ Moon here says, I saw the ending as Owen finally seeing what Tara was saying as true. And even if he decided to close his chest at that time, that once you see the truth, you can't unsee it. And Tara's message of there is still time had a hopeful edge to it. There is, there is a hope, there is a, a thread of hope throughout the entire movie. In fact, there's multiple sections of the film there's another one where Owen is walking down the halls of the school and all over the walls of the school are these messages that are like, you can do it. Uh, seize the day. The best time to do, it, to do it is now. Never give up. Like there's all these messages the environment is, is trying to communicate uh, to both the viewer and to Owen. Um, but at the end, uh, the, there's like this self horrible, horrifying self-harm scene and it does. I agree. I agree with you in saying that, like, I think that that scene communicates that Owen knows the truth, but also that Owen's only relief at this point is self-harm and uh, a, a, and like the fumes of nostalgia that Owen clings to uh, the, the, the videos of, of the pink opaque that aren't doing anything anymore the DVD versions on his uh, gigantic screen TV um, just can't, they're, they're not providing fuel. They're not actually comforting him anymore. And so he's had to turn to like this, 
this, you know, he quite literally cuts at himself in order to relieve the pain of what he knows is inside. Um, and, yeah. What's the movie title? I Saw the TV Glow. It's amazing. Um, Zoe Sof says, I don't think I have the heart to watch this movie. From everything I've heard from other trans girls, as a trans girl, watching this would devastate me. Um, but it's not, it's, it's a cautionary movie. It is a hard movie to watch. Um, but, uh, but it, it, and it is, it is, you, you will provoke emotions, but I think that it's a positive experience, especially if you're someone who chose not to make the path, or to take the path that Owen chose. It's devastating in an encouraging way? Of course it's devastating in an encouraging way, and the ultimate message of the movie is there is still time to everyone which there is. Um, I think this movie is really, really important. I think it's really, really important now. And uh, I treasure this movie. And I, if, you, if, you are, if you're hearing me go through all of this, just go see it anyway. Even with the spoilers, it won't ruin the movie for you. Uh, I promise you that the movie, the soundtrack and the visuals and the performances are so good that even if you've had the entire movie spoiled for you, it will still hit very, very well. Um, and uh, I, 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 I guess I don't have much else to say at this point. Um, no, actually I actually have one more thing. My, one of my favorite shots in the entire movie is this... Uh, there's two, and I love these shots for very funny reasons. There is one shot in the beginning of the movie where the two characters are sitting in a dark room and there's, they start making a friend, they start like they, they start their friendship in this dark, depressing room and the light, they're reading a book by the light of a vending machine. The rest of the room is all dark and, and blue and black and the, the vending machine is all pink and orange and lit brit up and, and it says Fruitopia, which is both a real product and also really funny because they're entering the, the 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 color represents going into Fruitopia, the land of the fruits. And there's a second one, by the way, um, where later on in the film they're in there. The two characters are it's when they meet again in a grocery store, and in the grocery store, uh, the the shot is extremely it's awkward, like. Owen is like this big at the bottom of the screen and up on the top of the screen is these giant like uh, uh, corporate logo fruits. It's a bunch of super colorful giant wall art of fruit and they're all just like hovering over this little tiny Owen as if he's surrounded by fruits. Um, it's, it's incredible. I, I actually love it. I love the like the like the fruit imagery uh, at various points, specifically when the two fruits of the film come together, uh, it's it's beautiful and I love it. Uh, anyway, that's my my long uh, uh, review of I saw the TV glow. It was longer than I intended, but I hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, I certainly enjoyed the movie. Um, I uh, am am I I really want people to go see it because it is a beautiful. Um, meditation on why you should never repress, on why repression will suffocate you uh, and and destroy your mind and soul. Uh, and it does so, it's communicated in this beautifully dreamy, uh, uh, just uh, fantastically heartfelt and horrifying film. Uh, go see it. I saw the TV glow. Um, absolutely amazing.